What's up, Pinedale kids? I want to welcome you to a special edition of Church at Home. Or maybe it's a special edition of HodgePodge. Either way, I am super excited about what we are about to do. We have been on a journey all the way through the Bible. We are showing you how the Bible isn't just a collection of random stories that aren't connected. Rather, it is a series of small stories that tell one big giant story about God loving us and saving us from our sins. This past Sunday, we reached the end of the Old Testament. And I wanna give you a huge review so we can know all the highlights and mountaintops of what we've been teaching you so far. That way, you'll be ready to start learning the New Testament, which kicks off this Sunday. So let's get started. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sun, moon, land, water, plants, animals, and on the sixth day, he created humans, both boys and girls, and he placed them in the Garden of Eden. And on the seventh day, God rested. God gave them just one simple rule. Don't eat from the one tree in the middle of the garden called the Tree of Knowledge. But the devil came along in the form of a snake and convinced them that God didn't really say that. You see? All sin is like that. The devil gets us to question God. Before Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they only knew good. After they ate the fruit, their eyes were open and they knew good and evil. They had committed the first sin. Because they disobeyed God or sinned, they were separated from God, banished from the garden forever. But check this out. God also made a promise that God would defeat the devil and one day would send us a redeemer to restore or, or rebuild our relationship between God and man. That's what the whole Bible is all about. God keeping his promises to send us a redeemer, someone to save us from our sins. After Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, they had a baby named Cain. And they also had another son named Abel. They both grew up to be big and strong. One day they both gave sacrifices to God. God accepted Abel's gift, but not Cain's. And this made Cain jealous, so he led his brother into a field. Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. So God banished Cain from his home and had him wander the, around the world for the rest of his life. From here, things continued to get worse and worse. Man's wickedness continued to grow. And when God saw that all of our thoughts were nothing but wickedness all the time, the Bible says that he regretted making man. Then the Lord said he was gonna wipe all man off the face of the earth by bringing this huge flood that would cover the whole earth. God found this guy by the name of Noah. He was a righteous man. So God commanded him to build a boat big enough to hold at least two of every animal on the earth, as well as his entire family. It then rained for 40 days and 40 nights. The flood went on for 150 days and covered the whole entire earth, even the tops of mountains. When the waters came down, Noah and his family came off the ark and they saw a rainbow. That was God's sign that he's making a promise that he would never flood the whole earth again. God told Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply. In other words, have lots of babies and make lots of people. Many years pass, we come to this guy, Abram. Eventually he becomes Abraham, but when we first meet him, his name is Abram. God told Abram to go out from the land that he was living in, and God was gonna show him a new land that he wanted him to live in, because he was gonna promise that land to Abram, and that Abram would become a great nation with lots of descendants. He promised to bless Abram and make his name great, and that all the people on the earth would be blessed through him. Abram had to journey a long ways to get to the land God was promising to him. Abram traveled from Ur to Haran, 
from Haran to Shechem, from Shechem to Egypt, and from Egypt all the way back where he was before. It was a long ways, but at least he wasn't alone. He had his wife Sarah with an eye with him, plus his nephew Lot and his family. Lot's family was blessed too, and soon his household got to be so big that Abram and Lot had to part ways. Abram told Lot to choose where he wanted to go. If Lot went right, Abram would go left. If Lot went left, Abram would go right. Lot thought that the land to the east looked pretty good, so he headed that way. Abram went to the west, and God promised that all the land he saw would one day belong to his family. Small problem. He didn't have a family. He didn't have any kids. So how could God promise him his family would have all that land one day? Well, God told Abram that Sarah would have a son and he should name him Isaac and he would be the one that would carry on God's promises. At that time, God changed her name from Sarah with an I to Sarah with an H, which means princess because she would give birth to kings. And God changed Abram's name to Abraham, which means father of multitudes. A year later, Sarah had a baby boy when she was 90 years old. And get this, Abraham was 100. Just like God commanded, they named their son Isaac. One day, God told Abraham to take his son Isaac to a mountain and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Abraham took his son to the place God told him to. He built an altar and he placed Isaac on it. And he pulled out a knife and was about to sacrifice his son when all of a sudden an angel called out and told him not to touch Isaac. It was a test to see if he would obey God. And there stuck in a bush was a ram that God had allowed Abraham to sacrifice instead. Abraham called that mountain, the Lord will provide. Interestingly, Abraham sacrificed a ram. Burnt offerings were supposed to be done with a perfect lamb. Eventually, Jesus, who was our perfect lamb, was sacrificed on that exact same mountain. Isn't it cool how God planned out that long before it happened? Ultimately, the meaning of that mountain did come true. The Lord did provide. Isaac ended up living a long life and a good life. He got married to a woman named Rebecca and they had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau was born first and he was real hairy. Jacob was born second and when he came out he was holding on to Esau's heel. Esau grew up to be a mighty hunter and Jacob liked to stay home. Isaac liked Esau better while Rebecca liked Jacob better. It's kind of like me and my brother, except my parents both liked me better. Jacob was a tricky fella. One day Esau was so hungry that he started begging Jacob for something to eat. Jacob said he would feed him if Esau would sell him his birthright. So Esau did. Jacob did some more trickery later when his dad was old, Isaac asked his son Esau to go make him his favorite meal so he could eat it and then bless him before he died. The only problem was, Rebecca was listening and she came up with a plan. Isaac was old and couldn't see very well, so Rebecca dressed Jacob up as Esau and had him pretend to be his brother. Jacob brought Isaac his meal, and since Isaac thought he was Esau, he blessed Jacob instead. That means the promise that went from Abraham to Isaac is now on Jacob instead of Esau. Esau was so mad that he planned on killing Jacob. So Jacob packed up his things and he left home. All the way through the Bible, we see God using people like Jacob who are not perfect and they mess up. It just goes to show you how powerful God is. And he's able to use someone like Jacob like you, like me, for his kingdom. After Jacob ran away from home, he started his own family. God gave him a new name, Israel. He ended up having 12 sons. 
Out of all of his sons, Joseph was his favorite. Jacob loved him so much that he gave him a coat of many colors. When his brothers saw it, they were jealous. So one day, when his brothers were all alone in the field, they took Joseph, beat him up, tied him up, and sold him into slavery. They then took his nice coat and put animal blood on it and told Jacob, or Israel, that he had been eaten by wild animals. Joseph was taken off to Egypt, but God had a plan all along. At one point, Joseph got thrown into jail when the Pharaoh, that's kind of like a king, had a dream. There was a guy who knew Joseph could interpret dreams, so they sent for Joseph. Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream and predicted that there would be seven years of good harvest with lots of food, followed by seven years of famine where there would be no food. Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of it and he became second in command of all of Egypt. For the next seven years, Joseph stored up all kinds of food. Then the famine came and it stretched all the way up to where Joseph came from where his family was still living. When Joseph's brothers heard that Egypt had food, they set out to see if they could get some. Joseph was super happy to see his brothers, and he invited his whole family to move there to Egypt and live with him. He even got to see his father Jacob again. Joseph knew that what his brothers had meant for evil, God meant for good. This is how God was going to keep his promise from all the way back at the beginning. That was first given to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and all of Israel's people. We then take a 400 year leap forward, and we discover that Jacob's 12 sons had grown into a pretty huge group of people. We're talking millions of people. They were called Israelites named after Jacob, who was also known as Israel. The Egyptians were afraid the Israelites would try to take over the nation, so the Egyptians made the Israelites become slaves. God chose Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. Originally, the Pharaoh tried to kill Moses by killing all the little babies, but God was at work and he protected Moses. He ended up growing up with an Egyptian family. And when he got older, he saw how poorly his people were being treated. God appeared to Moses and told him that he would be the one to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. When he went to the Pharaoh, it took some convincing to let God's people go. In fact, God had to bring 10 plagues or really bad things on Egypt before Pharaoh would finally let them go. God's last plague was the worst. Every firstborn child in the land of Egypt would die. The Israelites were the only ones who were spared. God told them to put lamb's blood on the doors of their houses. If they did, God would pass over their house and no one would die. Pharaoh finally gave in and told the Israelites to get out of Egypt. Shortly after they left Egypt, Pharaoh changed his mind and he sent his entire army after the Israelites to bring them back. He chased them all the way from Egypt to the Red Sea where they cornered them. There was no way they could escape. But then God sent a great wind and he caused the water to be parted and he pushed back the sea so that the Israelites could walk across on dry land. As soon as they got over, here came the Egyptians and they started to cross the Red Sea. God let the water go and the whole army drowned. After they crossed the Red Sea, God led the people to Mount Sinai where he declared that from now on, you're going to be my people. You're going to be my nation. You're going to live by my laws. And God gave Moses the laws, which included the Ten Commandments. Let's do a quick review of those commandments. Commandment number one, have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, do not bow down to other gods. Commandment number three, do not misuse God's name. Commandment number four, uh, what was it? Uh, oh yeah, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Commandment number five, honor your father and mother or you'll get a whooping. Commandment number six, do not kill. Commandment number seven, keep your promise to your husband or wife.
Commandment number eight, do not steal. Commandment number nine, do not lie. And commandment number two, don't want what other people have. Here's the problem with having rules. People are gonna break them. And when we disobey God, that's called a sin. Turns out, we all have sinned. All the way back to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Abraham, Noah, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, and the list goes on. We all have sinned. That's why we need a redeemer, someone to save us from our sins because we have all disobeyed God. After the Israelites made it out of Egypt, they traveled for miles and miles in the desert, complaining the whole time. Eventually, they made it to the edge of the promised land, and they decided to send 12 scouts to spy on the land and check out what's there. The 12 spies went into the promised land for 40 days. When they returned, 10 of them said, the people already living there are so big and strong and mighty, there's no way we could fight them. Those 10 suggested that we go find somewhere else to live. Two of the spies were guys by the name of Joshua and Caleb. They pointed out that God had promised them this land and that they should go in and take it away from the people that were living there. The Israelites decided to listen to the 10 bad spies though. And because of their lack of faith, God sent them back into the desert to wander around aimlessly for the next 40 years until that entire generation who had no faith had died off time finally came for the people to enter the land that God had promised Abraham so long ago. The only ones alive that were there before were Joshua and Caleb because they were courageous and they had trusted God. Remember, there were people living in the promised land and the Israelites had to drive them out. Their very first battle was a city called Jericho who was known for their wall that was all the way around their city. Just look at how big the wall was around this city. God told Joshua to have the people walk around the city one time every day for six days, and then seven times on the seventh day. When they finished, they blew their trumpets and the walls fell down. Joshua and his army won their first battle. God continued to let them win battles until they had taken over the entire promised land. They divided the land into 12 parts one for each of the Israelite tribes, or one for each of the sons of Israel, who was also known as Jacob. Remember that? Soon a new problem developed. There were still people living there in the Promised Land. Those people didn't believe in God. Those people convinced the Israelites to start worshiping false gods. And that was a big problem because do you remember what commandment number one was? Have no other gods before me do not bow down to other gods. Well, because the Israelites were disobeying God, God allowed other nations to come in and conquer them so that they would learn to, de to depend on him and obey him again. During this time, God sent judges or people who were kind of like a, a spiritual leader, sort of like Moses and Joshua were. Some of those judges were people like Deborah, who was a mighty warrior, and Gideon, who won a big battle with only 300 men, and another one named Samson, who had great strength because he obeyed God when he was told to never cut his hair. Every time God sent a judge to lead the Israelites, they would turn back to God, but only for a little while, and soon they would go right back to doing the same thing they were doing before and worshiping false gods. God would bless them, they would disobey God, God would punish them, God would send a messenger, they would turn back to God, God would bless them, they would disobey God, and this pattern went on over and over and over again for 400 years. After that time, the Israelites said they were tired of having judges be their leaders. They didn't want to have the judge anymore. Instead, they wanted to have a king like the other countries around them. All right, that sounds good because God did say that he was going to one day send us a redeemer to save us from our sins and that this redeemer would be the king of the whole world. So maybe that's who we're going to meet next. Well, 
Eventually, yes we will, but not just yet. The first king was a guy by the name of Saul, and he definitely looked like the king. Just one problem. He did things his way and not God's way. So God found someone new to be king. There was this time when the Israelites were at war with a group called the Philistines. One of their soldiers was a giant man named Goliath. He challenged them to a fight. If one of their soldiers could come and defeat him, they would leave the Israelites alone. Goliath challenged them day after day, but none of the Israelites were brave enough to fight him. Not even Saul, the king, was brave enough to go fight Goliath. One day, a brave Israelite came forward to challenge him. He was just a shepherd boy named David. David trusted God and knew God would be on his side. So he picked up some smooth rocks and grabbed his sling. Goliath laughed when he saw David. David put a rock in the sling and he slung it with all of his might towards the giant and it hit him right in the forehead and it killed him. David did lots of great things and even won lots of big battles. But what made him great was that he was a man after God's own heart. That's why God chose David to be the next king and replace Saul. Eventually, Saul was killed in a battle and God made David the new king. What mattered most to God was not his looks, but what was in his heart. Once David became king, he made Jerusalem the capital of Israel, and he returned the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant was a special box. It was made out of all gold, and it represented the presence of God. Inside of it, it held the Ten Commandments. Since the time of Moses, the Israelites carried this box with them wherever they went. The Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, but David got it back and returned it to the Israelites. When he did, he made plans to build a temple to keep it in. God was happy that David wanted to build a temple, but he told him it wouldn't be him that would build it, instead it would be somebody else that would build the temple. God promised to bless David's family and even promised the future Redeemer would come from his bloodline. David made lots of mistakes as king, but when he did, he would ask God to forgive him and he would start doing things right. After King David died, his son Solomon took over and he was the one who ended up building the temple. That was a big undertaking. How is he going to be able to do such a huge project? Well, when Solomon first became king, God appeared to him in a dream. God told him he could ask for anything and it would be given to him. Instead of asking for a lot of money or long life, Solomon asked for wisdom to rule the people. God granted his request and made him the wisest man who ever lived. His wisdom became known all around the world. He was also good at solving problems. One time there were these two women arguing over a baby. Both of them claimed to be the boy's mother, but neither of them could prove who he belonged to. Solomon came up with a plan. He ordered for a sword to be brought in. And he gave the sword to a soldier and told him to cut the baby in two so that the ladies could each have half the baby. When Solomon said that, one of the women was all right with the idea. The other woman, who really was the boy's mother, pleaded for the boy's life. That's how Solomon knew she was the boy's mother, so he gave the baby to her. Not only was Solomon wise, he was also the richest king to ever live. But was he the perfect king that God had promised to be the redeemer? Nope. Unfortunately, Solomon fell in love with his riches and his power, and he started disobeying God. When he got older, he started worshiping false gods. He even built altars to them. So God took his blessing off of Solomon and promised to divide the kingdom into two. After Solomon died, the people were excited to have a new king. His name was Rehoboam. 
The people were hoping that Rehoboam would take it easy on them because his dad Solomon had made them work so hard. Since Rehoboam was new at his job, he asked for some advice on what he should do. His older advisors told him to give the people what they wanted, but his younger friends told him he should make the people work even harder than before. And that's what he did. This caused a division in the kingdom. It caused 10 of the tribes to split off and form their own nation. The 10 tribes to the north kept the name Israel, and they were ruled by a new leader, Jeroboam. The two tribes in the south called themselves Judah, and they were ruled by Solomon's son, Rehoboam. The temple was in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was located in Judah. Jeroboam didn't want the people going back down to Jerusalem to worship at the temple because he was afraid that if the people went back there to worship, they may want to join back up with Judah. So he built two temples for worship in the northern kingdom. And he put two golden calves in those temples. God didn't like that, so he brought disaster on Jeroboam. He died and his son took over as king. And now it's time to have a flashback. And now we're gonna spice things up with a little game I'm gonna call Good King, Bad King. All right, kids, I need everybody to stand up. Today is your lucky day. You're the first contestant ever on the show. Good King, Bad King. The way this is gonna work is I will tell you about one of Israel's kings. And you will tell me if that is a good king or a bad king. If you think he's a good king, I want you to move over to this side of the room. If you think he's a bad king, move over to this side of the room. Now, you should have put your signs up somewhere in the room, so now that you know it's good king and bad king. I think I may have told you different earlier, and if I did, just move the signs around. You guys ready? All right, here's our first king. King Nadab was Jeroboam's son. He did evil in the Lord's sight and followed his father, father's example. So is that a good king or a bad king? Bad king. Ding, 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 ding. You are correct. Round two. King Basha. Basha murdered Nadab and his entire family. Good king or bad king? Correct. Next round. King Elah. Elah got drunk and worshipped idols. Good king or bad king? You guessed it, bad king. Mm, I'm starting to see a pattern. How many more of these are there? Let me see. Yeah, there's 19. All right, do you guys want to do a lightning round? All right, here we go. King Zimri murdered King Elah. King Omra worshiped idols. King Ahab, oh, ooh. All right, we're gonna have to talk about him next week. Moving on. King Ahaza, King Joram, King Jehu destroyed a bunch of idols. Wait a minute, hold on. Actually, that sounds pretty good. Eh, sorry. King Jehu still worshiped the golden calves. So the answer we're looking for was bad. Yeah, he's bad. Yep, he, he was bad. All right, let's see. I've got nine of these left. Guess what? They were all bad. Literally every single one of Israel's kings were bad. None of them led the people back to God. And that was bad news for Israel. Even though the kings were bad, there were some good people around. They were called the prophets. One of the most famous prophets was Elijah. Elijah lived during the reign of King Ahab, one of the worst kings of Israel. One day, Elijah came to King Ahab and told him there would be a famine over all the land because of Israel's disobedience. Ahab blamed Elijah for the famine and tried to kill him. Elijah challenged Ahab to see whose God was real, the God of Israel or Ahab's God, Baal. They went to Mount Carmel and set up two altars, one for Baal and one for the real God. Here was the challenge. 
They would pray to their own God to bring down fire on the sacrifice on the altar. Whichever God did it was the one true God. There were 450 prophets of Baal, and they started first. They prayed from morning till night, but nothing happened. Finally, Elijah got up and gathered the people around him. He poured water on the altar to make it even harder for God to answer the prayer. Elijah then prayed, and instantly fire came down and burned up the altar and everything around it. After that, a huge rainstorm came and the famine ended. Now you'd think that after seeing something great like that, that it would cause the people to turn away from their sin and start following God? But they didn't. Instead, they continued to disobey God. So God sent even more prophets to tell them that bad things would happen to them if they didn't repent of their sin and turn back to God. Elijah had a helper named Elisha. There was also Amos and Hosea and one named Jonah. Sadly, the kings of Israel were too concerned with their own power to care about God. The prophets warned that if the Israelites kept disobeying God, something terrible was going to happen to them. That's exactly what happened. Israel was invaded by the king of Assyria. He took all the Israelites and scattered them all over the Assyrian Empire. That was the end of the nation of Israel. Now the only Israelites left are in the southern kingdom, the two tribes to the south called Judah. King Rehoboam also got the people to worship false gods. However, Judah did have some good kings. For example, King Asa obeyed God and got rid of all the idols. King Jehoshaphat, that's a funny name to say, trusted God so God gave him victory in battle. And King Hezekiah was a good king who called his people to worship God. They started off pretty good, but then came King Manasseh. He ruled for 55 years and he got the people to worship false gods. He even set up an altar inside the temple to a false god. Manasseh did turn back to God later in life, but the damage was already done. The people were all worshiping idols, including his own son, Amon, who became king next. Haman only lasted two years before he died. Then his son, Josiah, became king when he was only eight years old. King Josiah did some pretty awesome stuff. First, he followed God. He took down all the idols in the temple. And there he found the book of the law written by Moses. He gathered all the people together and he read it to all the people and made them promise they would obey God's law. But just like the northern kingdom, Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah also had prophets. And one of those prophets was a guy by the name of Jeremiah. Even though Judah did have some good kings, they also worshiped the false idols and they disobeyed God constantly. A whole lot, actually. God was still going to punish Judah for all of their idolatry. Eventually, the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, invaded Judah. He destroyed the temple and took the people to Babylon. Oh no! What about the promised land? What about God's chosen people? What about God's promise to Abraham? What about God's promise of a redeemer? Well, just because God's people were scattered all over the nation of Babylon, he hadn't forgotten about them. The people of Judah were forced to become servants to King Nebuchadnezzar. One of those servants was a guy by the name of Daniel. Daniel was able to interpret the king's dreams. So he became King Nebuchadnezzar's most trusted advisor. Daniel had three Israelite friends named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One day, King Nebuchadnezzar came up with a very bad idea. He decided to make a statue made of pure gold that was 90 feet tall. Nebuchadnezzar gathered all of his servants around the statue and ordered that any time the horns were played, that the people had to bow down and worship the statue. If they didn't, they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. 
When the horns played, everyone bowed down. Everyone that is except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They worshiped the God of Israel and they knew they couldn't worship any other God. So King Nebuchadnezzar had them thrown into the furnace. But when the king looked into the furnace, he saw them standing there. And there was a fourth guy standing in there with him. God protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar made a proclamation that from that day on, no one could say anything bad about Israel. The king after Nebuchadnezzar was a king by the name of Darius. Daniel served Darius just like he had served Nebuchadnezzar. This made some of the other advisors jealous and they came up with a plan to get rid of Daniel. They told Darius to make a law that if anyone prayed to anyone but him, they would be thrown into a den of lions. King Darius made the law, but because Daniel was faithful to the God of Judah, he got arrested. Darius was sad when he found out about Daniel because he liked him so much. Because he had made the law, he had to throw Daniel into the lion's den. Darius worried about Daniel all night. The next morning when he checked on him, Daniel was just fine. The lions hadn't touched him. God protected him from the lions. After Daniel was set free, the king ordered the guys who had plotted against Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. Now let's just say it didn't go well for them. The Israelites were forced to stay in Babylon for 70 years, just like the prophet Jeremiah had predicted. But that wasn't God's plan for them to stay there forever. When their time of their punishment was over, he brought them back to the land God had promised to Abraham. A new king came along and he just let everyone go. He said, anyone that wants to go home can go home. God's people, the Israelites, returned to their homes in Judah. Because they were from Judah, they had become known as Jews. The first group of people to return home was led by a guy by the name of Zerubbabel. When he got back to Jerusalem, he led the people to rebuild the temple. Ezra was a priest and he came and he encouraged the people and he taught the people to follow God's ways. Later, another man by the name of Nehemiah brought a group of Jews home to rebuild the wall that went around Jerusalem. Once the wall and the temple were rebuilt, the people worshiped God and repented of their sin. And that right there brings you up to speed. This Sunday, we pick up our journey through the entire Bible by starting in the New Testament with the birth of Jesus, who turns out is the Redeemer that God has promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden. I want to thank you for watching. Be sure to join us this Sunday for Church at Home as we continue the story. I love you guys. Bye-bye.